Hi, everyone. Uh, first, briefly, we're going to be recording tonight, so please uh, mute your cell phones if you don't mind. Um, welcome. A uh, quick show of hands. How many of you have been here before to this room? Oh, wow. That is great. That's great. For those of you who haven't, uh, you are in the Studio for Creative Inquiry. This is the College of Fine Arts' uh, laboratory for experimental and new media. We are a research laboratory and outreach center for atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research projects at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. Uh, and we're really interested in emerging media, open source media, and uh, the intersection of art and technology in particular. Um, and so it's my great pleasure to, um, to first of all, uh, thank the Watson Fellow, uh, the, the Watson Festival, for their continued uh, part collaboration. It's great to to work with them again. You, you, it's it's an honor of Jill Watson, and um, we're delighted to to honor her memory with a festival across the arts. Tonight's uh, presenters are um, exemplary of what we like to support here in, in the Watson Festival and in the Studio for Creative Inquiry. Um, Addie Wagenknecht and Stefan Heckenberger are an Austro-American couple. Um, who uh, originally met in the Interactive Telecommunications Program at the uh, New York University and have been working at the intersection of open source and um, popular culture and um, hacktivist arts uh, for the last mm, five, ten years? Seven or eight years, between there. I first met them in New York City when they were residents at IBEAM, uh, Center for Art and Technology, uh, which is uh, a major supporter of, uh, of open source uh, and free uh, software for the arts and uh, an open source culture. Um, they are significant leaders right now in the area of um, tools made for artists by artists to radically democratize the production of new kinds of art. Um, so among other credits, you'll see you've already gotten a gander at the laser saw, which is a, um, an open hardware, which is to say open source laser cutter. Um, it's uh, in, in but tomorrow, when we when we when we are doing demonstrations and firing it up, um, it will be actively uh, the largest and most powerful laser cutter in the entire university for about one tenth the cost. Um, and they'll tell you the full story of that. They've also got a, a really w rich and wide variety of, of interesting art, uh, both made with um, their own laser sores and and without. And so, with with no further ado, I, I'm it's my great pleasure to introduce Addie and Stefan from Nort Labs. Um, so hey everyone, I'm, I'm Addie and this is Stefan, as you probably figured out. Uh, so we're the founders of Nord. Uh, we, we established this collaboration in about 2005, 2006, um, when we were interested in kind of this outputting of artistic research and development for humanity and the greater good. Um, so really quick, we're just going to give you a brief overview of our previous projects and then talk a little bit about what we've been working on here um, and our manifestos and such. So with that, uh, Stefan will take over. Um, so the presentation was spanned from our vintage projects that we, st like we started about uh, uh, 2006, that's when we started, to the speed projects we did part of this uh, mini residency and, um, and the laser saw. So um, just to give you like a, a sense where we're coming from, um, um, most of our projects, they revolve around software in one way or another, but you not necessarily recognize it right away. But that's usually like sort of the, um, the ingredients that allows us to do something very quickly and efficiently or like try new things out. So there are some themes uh, mm, we have been visiting with our projects and one is uh, form generation. Uh, so the first project I want to show you is um, about pseudo-architectural space. Um, it's a language for describing space and leaving uh, sort of design decisions open. Um, this one shows uh, two uh, design decisions that are left open. One is the angle, and one is sort of the distance between the walls. And it's not limited to two. You can have 10, 20 dimensions open. And then you just say, like, generate the whole design space. and. What you do as, uh, as a creator, you start like navigating the design space and become a, a curator of that uh, design domain. Um, this is uh, another project. Uh, um, it's, it's very typical to do that now that you just take a surface and, and break it up into uh, profile rips so you can actually cut it on 
use um, two-dimensional materials and create three-dimensional space. Uh, back then, we had to write uh, all the scripts ourselves, so take the surface, like break it up, um, and it just gives you the cut files. So I'm gonna be moving, we're gonna be moving very quickly, so this is, okay, closer. Okay, okay is this better? Okay, um, so this is Nesting House again. It's kind of an architectural project. We were playing with the idea of cohabitation of various species and spaces in urban dwellings, um, and specifically this uh, conflict we had when we heard out that, that they spend millions and millions of dollars in New York City on pesticides to kill pigeons and rats. And we kind of were, qu we were curious about the question of, can you take that money and apply it to, in an architectural sense so that you could actually have these pests um, cohabitate with humans? Um, there's sort of this aesthetic dimension with it. Um, I think the reason for this is um, anything that's a habitat, uh, we're kind of primed for like a habitat, so there's like an aesthetic quality that automatically happens once you create a habitat. Uh, next theme is uh, playing with motion, both analytically and synthetically. Um, this is, um, this was a project done for the dance department at NYU. They do something, um, it's called the Laban language. It's a notation for um, motion. And they had this problem that is very hard to teach. So this project was about creating this embeddable flash player that just takes motion capture data and uh, visualizes it in real time. So you could take very small motion capture files and just look at them and sort of teach the language. Had to uh, a whole series of projects with motion. Um, this is, um, yeah, it's about 2006-ish, it's called mo Motion Space. It's about sort of taking uh, the moment and stretching it out in time. So it, it lasts longer. Uh, specifically, we, we only used two points uh, of the motion and, and created sort of this more uh, permanent structure from that. This was a dancer who just dropped in. There was this was a lucky, lucky moment for us. I'm gonna keep moving. Just okay. <laughs> so um, another iteration of of this series of work is sort of looking at uh, head motion, hand motion, uh, and uh, and sort of that motion fault it creates. Um, yeah, it, it's a fault line, and you have basically this whole continuum of motion, and you can just you can take an hour of motion and just pick the one part that you really like. It's again uh, like a, mo a, a design space that you can navigate and sort of be the curator of of this whole set of of artifacts. Um, Blackhawk Paint was a computer vision kind of installation. We were playing with the idea of using drones as artists. So we set up a computer vision system which basically would allow you to manipulate the drone, or in this case we were using a helicopter as kind of a proof of concept, um, to manipulate and control that as a drawing tool. So instead of using a brush, we were actually using these helicopters. <coughs> and they would dip into the paint, as you can see on the lower, head, lower left, and kind of create these um, Pollock-esque paintings on the gallery floors, and each one was individual and unique, so I was raising this question of if robots can create art, it, what is art? Um, um, this is about uh, creating a, a space that sort of provokes a certain uh, choreography. Um, it's, a, it's a personal space that lives in a, in a public space, so it creates this very small personal space between two people. And uh, just by the design of the object, it sort of provokes a certain kind of motion. Um, the way you wear it is there were sort of this lazy Susan discs on your head, so you could spin under it as soon as you would stay within that certain distance of the other person. So it was, it was really about, again, creating this like intimacy in, in non-intimate environments, and specifically in New York, where you just don't have any space. Um, so this project was um, a computer vision project which was actually really heavily influenced by a piece we saw from Golan. Um, and we kind of raised the question of, can you use your body as a musical instrument? Um, so this again was set up using a computer vision system. We had a camera set up um, on the ceiling. There were four projection displays around the, the room. 
Um, and basically what happened is, as the artist moved or the dancer moved in real time and moved around on the floor, it, it would create um, these real time sort of compositions of, of music. Um, I believe it was one, the X axis was, do you remember? Yeah. Octaves and the Y axis was, uh, I think a C. I don't even remember anymore. We did this project in around 2006, 2007 again. Yeah, it's basically a, a, a scan line. It would, would go from uh, left to right, and um, it would sort of generate this very dark image, black and white image, very blurred, um, along with like this very heavy organ music. And yeah. Um, so Shadow Project, again, kind of goes back to the architecture thing um, and playing with a sense of real time um, and a sense of play between the user and, and the actual static object. And, and we were interested in playing with walls specifically for this piece. Uh, so we developed a set of motors and microprocessors which controlled different uh, setups and iterations of the system. So we did string, we did this rather like iconic kind of um, Gaudi-esque wallpaper that's now very common. Uh, and then we did some stuff with rear projection material. I think we have a video in here also, there we go. So the, one of the main questions with this piece was uh, if, if architecture is um, an interface to a habitation in the real world, um, how can it be uh, this space for the virtual? You know, how can it house um, data? And if not just data, how can it be an interface between the two? So the way this was controlled was actually reacting to people in the room. So as people were walking into the gallery, the pieces were moving um, in, in a reaction to them. And it was sort of like a dance. Um, as someone would walk towards it, it would retract. And as, as someone walked away, it, it would go forward. Um, okay. Modes of interaction. Oh. Moving on to um, modes of interaction. That's when we got very interested in sort of like typical graphical user interfaces um, with the addition of multi-touch. And that was before the iPhone, so multi-touch was not necessarily very common. So um, we looked for sort of a supplier for the hardware and couldn't find one, which led to this project, which is the Qubit project. Um, uh, it was about the time Open Framework came around, so it was kind of getting easier to get into computer vision. So we could do all the computer vision ourselves. So we used this kind of rear projection setup to actually sense like multiple fingers and hands on, on the surface of this qubit. Um, and what's interesting, I guess, about this project for us is that it was really the starting point of, of this wanting to, this, this intense desire and need to demystify these elite technologies and bring them down to a place where people could access them or at least had the information available to, to understand how they function. Uh, part of the frustration we had was when we wanted to do these multi-touch systems like Stefan said is that they were thirty to fifty thousand dollars and we were students and we had five hundred each and that was a, at the time a huge investment. Uh, to see if we can make this happen. And, and this was really kind of what launched us in this, on the path that I think we're in now. Uh, so that project's an interesting example of, of how, if, if you put things out there and out there and out there, how, how much that can carry your career. For us, the Qubit was a project where we released it and it was kind of dying out. We were doing other projects at the time. Uh, and we actually got a, uh, what was this person? A, uh, do you remember the article? It was like the technology. The MIT or Technology Review contacted us and she said, I'm really into multi chats so I would love to interview you. And from that one single article, it carried us four or five years financially in terms of commissions and exhibitions and projects. So as students, it's something that we constantly encourage other students to do was to release, release, release and put it out there and, and you never know who's gonna see it and how that affects your career in the long run. Um, so we developed the touch kit uh, basically as a supply and demand thing. People wanted the qubits, but we didn't want to be able to manufacture them. So we built an open source uh, iteration of the, of the qubit, which people could build themselves or, or buy from us. 
This is the second iteration. It was a Spark. It was just a slightly larger screen. It's, it's just using uh, IR lights. And from there, we developed um, actually like a programming framework. Uh, so for us, this was really the departure from software. It was still heavily based on software, like all the computer vision was done in software, all the, the smart parts, it was just the hardware was basically the dumb part of, of the system, and the rest was software. And at that time, at that time, um, s like all the operating systems, like Windows start, just started having an API, so you could write um, against an API and have sort of multi-touch information, but you wouldn't have the hardware yet, and macOS wouldn't have the API. So we basically had to create all of that pretty much from scratch. So part of that was uh, writing this, this API and widgeting system that um, is different from what normally runs on a computer. It, it needs to be able to rotate and scale. Um, so that was like called Virtual Awesome, and we did a couple of applications with that. Uh, one was this one, it's like a DJing application. So moving on, um, so this was the precursor to the, to the laser saw project, and uh, the, the history of the laser saw project is really this like this like need for for laser cutter, but also this fascination with opening up designs, demystifying uh, like complex technology, and sort of creating this community of sharing, and through that basically having access. Um, uh, to a lot of a lot of possibilities, like a lot of what you put out there openly, a lot of comes back, and it's it's a, it's this uh, ecology that that starts to happen. And at that time, we weren't sure whether uh, it transfers from software to hardware, and it's still it's getting clearer and clearer, and uh, it definitely works uh, with circuit boards. And the question is, how far can you really push that? You know, to what kind of hardware can you push that? And uh, the LASSO project itself is open hardware, but it's also a key technology for making open hardware happen. Because a lot of open hardware relies on sort of, there's this step that's different from software. It, you actually have to reproduce the item. With software, you just copy it and you're done with it. And with hardware, you actually have to build it. And uh, technologies like a laser cutter or a 3D printer or a mill sort of make this step much simpler. So it takes out the complexity of actually re reproducing open, open hardware designs. Let's reload this. Um, but I think this is an interesting uh, example of, of never, you should never wait till you're 100% sure you can do something before you do it, because you end up not doing it. For us, this was really an example of that. We had, we were, we were about, 70, 60 to 70% sure we might be able to do this, but there's a lot of uncertainty and fear, uh, but we went forward with it anyways. <coughs> um, so, so we built this laser, we built the laser cutter with the goal that it was open sourceable, easily repeatable, um, and the parts were globally sourceable, meaning that uh, we didn't necessarily pick the cheapest sources, but we picked sources that were highly reliable so that if you're ordering it in Japan or the US or South Africa, you could get the same pieces consistently, and it was really about repeat repeatability for us versus price. So this is what it actually is. So you have a pretty good glimpse because there's the actual thing standing there. Um, it's a laser cutter, it's 100 watts, uh, it has a, a cutting area of uh, four foot by two foot by two feet. Um, it, it cuts organic materials, um, anything basically a CO2 laser can cut, which is uh, plywood, plastics, um, textiles, that kind of stuff, paper. Um, 
and uh, it has it has this quality of it has like the the accuracy that you would want from a laser cutter. There's a certain cutting with um, there's a certain imprecision with the laser, but it's the precision we wanted to achieve for this is 0.1 millimeter, which is 100 microns. Um, which means you can do multiple cuts. You can do 10 cuts on plywood and cut exactly into the same area. Uh, so one of the interesting things about an open source project is that you can have a community that not only is supportive and develops along with you, but they share their iterations. So uh, here's an example of a table variation that it's slatted versus honeycomb. Um, here's, you can see really quickly just what the standard parts look like for assembly. There's um, really standard 80-20, uh, and the goal with, was that you could build this just using an Allen wrench and a soldering iron. Uh, these are the custom parts. Uh, those are examples for assemblies. Um, uh, the typically assemblies, they are built around uh, aluminum extrusions, and Wherever we needed sort of like precision that falls out of that grid of aluminum extrusions, uh, we have those c uh, custom cut parts, and they're all planar, which means you can cut them out out of planar material. So um, if you have access to a laser cutter or mill, you can do it yourself, or we provide them so sort of to get started. And there are very few of those pieces. Um, like this is basically all the pieces that are that are custom plus a small circuit board. Uh, which which main purpose is to actually simplify the wiring. You could actually wire it without the circuit board. Um, this is another example. Um, uh, a design decision we made uh, for the cutter is we we don't use proprietary rails. So the head actually runs straight on the aluminum extrusion, which sort of um, um, is because we're following this goal of not having any sort of cutting down on the dependencies. Um, uh, there, are very, uh, there are many proprietary solutions to this problem, but then you like sort of lock to this one company and you, you can't really move out if you don't like it anymore or if, it, if you live in an area uh, where, they don't, where they don't ship. So on this one, we have different iterations. Uh, we added sort of this like nicely integrated air assist. Um, um, like here again, sort of the frame iterations. Uh, when you look back to the current one, there's like we, we changed this, the frame slightly. It's the it's simplified, uh, so there are less connections uh, to make. Uh, I briefly want to to mention sort of the cover panels. Um, this was a decision we made uh, to actually have them have a supplier that can provide them pre-cut. Uh, and pre-paint it. Uh, this is something you could trade for, like if, you, if you're operating on a smaller budget, you can trade something like that, you can do it yourself, uh, cut down on a budget, it would take more time to assemble the thing. Uh, but it's very nice to have sort of the option that you can have all the parts pre-cut and all you have to do is really just put the, the fasteners, the bolts in, and it comes together like that. And This is this sort of the performance you get. Um, this is uh, four millimeter plywood. Um, cuts at two meters per minute. And the, the maximum thickness we were able to cut with a reasonable speed was uh, a little bit less than half, half an inch of plywood. So with those sort of speeds, you can really run a small shop pretty efficiently without much problem. I don't know what order these are in. Uh, this is one of our first cuts, actually. Uh, I think it's four millimeter plexi, but you can see, uh, and then we don't have the air assist attached, so there's a little bit more smoke than usual. Um, what's important to mention here, uh, this is running of a much smaller tube. It's a 40 watt version. Um, uh, because you can basically put any kind of laser in the back you can think of. Uh, if, if you want to put like, you know, a, a cheap 40 watt, which is like a, a third of the price, uh, if you want to, if you got a refurbished Synred laser, you can put it in the back, there's enough space, so you just mount the laser in the back, adjust uh, the mirrors, and you're ready to go. Oh, this is actually, I guess, our first cut. One of our first cuts. Yeah. How many have I got? There's one. Um, 
This is one where it's cutting actually its own parts. And uh, as I mentioned before, you can actually put different lasers in the back. So we were playing around with uh, solid state lasers because we thought uh, probably those kinds of lasers are the ones uh, that go down in price the most in the future because they're basically based on, uh, based on this, um, this module in the middle which uses LEDs which are tightly packed around the crystal. And that kind of stuff looks like it would go down in price a lot. So we build one, put one in the back, <laughs> and... Um, but I think also like something that's interesting to point out yeah. about the, the solid states versus the CO2 which we're using now is that they're much more compact, so it allows you to build more compact systems. Uh, and they're more stable in terms of shipping and if you're trying to be nomadic. Uh, so here we are, this is actually cutting metal with a, with a solid state. So this is, this is work in progress. Uh, it's, n it's not production quality yet, but it's sort of like a proof of concept. Um, Part of this project is not just that you have sort of a, a laser cutter at the end. It's not, it's not the product that counts. It's, it's really sort of um, the community that, that it enables. Uh, and uh, this is sort of at the core of, opens, of the open source movement. It's, it's not a license agreement necessarily. It's really a form of collaboration. Uh, and for this project, it's also the community that's very interesting for us because we get a lot of feedback. We got a, get a lot of testing that we otherwise couldn't do. We get a, get a lot of knowledge that comes in. And we are basically the ones who have like one reference design of the laser cutter and like all that feedback we just like put into this reference design, sort of boil it down and try to keep it simple. That's sort of our function in that. Um, and this is how it, how it works in a lot of projects. It's really sort of the promise of the internet. It's like people work together and create these groups of action uh, and knowledge exchange and uh, this open communication. Basically what sort of the, the term many to many means as opposed to you just you know, use this as a form of, of consuming something top down. Uh, but something I, th I find really beautiful about the community is that the purpose of the project was really to bring it down to the masses and or make it available to the masses and people have done exactly that. So Frank and Amsterdam actually built the system so that anyone could come and use it at, for a very, very nominal fee uh, and gave people access and, and there's different people, uh, Till's in Frankfurt and he's actually building them so kids can use them and he has a huge hangar with laser cutters and the kids come and they build these really cool kind of like paper airplanes and, and fire blowing cars and all this stuff he sends us pictures of. Um, and we also get people iterating quite a bit. So this was uh, one of our first, oh, you wanna start talking? Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking about testing. So um, this is a guy in Canada who, he didn't get the lens right away. So he wanted to try out I mean, how much can you prevent the paper from catching fire if you use nitrogen. So, the, the reason why the cut is so, so thick is because the, there's no focusing going on right there. Usually like that paper would just ignite and burn, but if you just have enough nitrogen, you can just prevent that from happening. So that's, that's very interesting feedback. Uh, and we get a lot like that, which is very helpful. Uh, so we have a lot of interesting people. We have, we have hackerspaces building them. We have um, people, this is a Marcin who's working on this open village construction kit. Um, who's building these brick machines and steel cutters and uh, what else was he building? Torch tables um, in the middle of Missouri to kind of re redefine how you build a, a, a construction kit and a global community. Um, <laughs> people, we showed at people Maker Fair, there's research groups using it. Um, there's universities using it, uh, Culture Lab in the UK, uh, CMU's got one now which we're super excited about. Uh, New York University, there's, so there's quite an academic falling we're getting now, which is exciting as well. Um, so really quick, we just want to wrap up uh, to show you some speed projects, which is kind of just to completely change the topic. Uh, so a speed project is basically the idea that it's something you can do in as little as five minutes, 30 seconds, or up to a day or two. 
Um, and so these are some of the things we've done with speed projects. <coughs> Um, this is just this idea of uh, playing with anonymity, and it's it. This was a I don't know 30-minute project we did uh, in New York a, f a few years ago. Um, this this one kind of plays with the paranoia and um, over secured areas that we had a lot of problems in New York getting things in and out of the city that were for ridiculous reasons, and FedEx would constantly hold us up. And this was kind of a reaction to that. So it's actually two-dimensional, just laser cut, uh, these iconic 8-bit eight, eight sort of bombs that we would place around the city with messages on them. <laughs> um, as, okay, so this is the speed project we actually did here while we were residents uh, at the studio. Um, and I just wanted to thank Madeline really quick. She was a rock star, and she helped not only teach us how to program the robot arm, but help us make this project possible. And it's uh, what did we what did we end up calling this? <laughs> the, I think we call this the optimization of parenthood, and it's playing with this like idea of the monotony and repeatability of parenthood, and how you could make it easier for the parents. <laughs> so. Um, when the baby starts crying, it rocks it faster, and then when it slows, d when the baby stops crying, it, it slows down again. And we did this at the DFAB uh, downstairs in the architecture school. <coughs> so <laughs> this is the second project we did here as residents at the Studio for Creative Inquiry. It's an iPhone brick case. So it iPhone cozy, yeah. Oh, it's actually an iPhone cozy, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's basically a 3D printed ode to the uh, brick phones right. of our past. Um, and this was also completely made possible with Zach's help. And thank you so much for being so positive and so awesome and helping us execute this so well. And it works, it works well. <laughs> And a shout out to Chet, who has been one of our early supporters of the project. He actually built the fourth laser cutter, uh, and he's like helping us a lot with this build. No, actually, uh, Basel has a few, and New York has a few in San Francisco. But you guys could keep building them and catch up, no problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> so just really quick, not to sound like the Oscars, we just wanted to thank some people, um, Pablo and Spike have been amazing, and thank you so much for inviting us for the What's On Festival. Golan has continued to be a major inspiration in our work and our lives. Um, all the students who helped build Laser Store here, we're immensely impressed with your skills and ability and enthusiasm. Um, and Madeline and Zach and Jonathan, just for being amazing, and you're like student ninjas. I don't know what you do, but we love you. So thank you guys all so much. Um, if you have any questions, we're, we're open to taking them. And Please feel free to hang out.